is he has a say he's also been the member of the editorial board of scientific reports published by nature publication group which is a very very prestigious uh, journal and of course associate editor of the current science uh, uh, distinguished professor at ashoka university at present though he spent a long inning at iser pune uh, i can go on but i will not I, what i would like to mention is that professor shashidhar has an uncanny ability to spot talent to nurture talent and this is something that has made him endeared him to all the young scholars in this discipline and i think this is one aspect which i thought among others that he might like to share and help you all to aim at asking fundamental questions because he has asked some very fundamental questions about differentiation in the organisms how do cells differentiate into different org organs and how do the cells determine uh, what size those organs will have this is the a question which is at the very basis of life and there are many other questions that he has been asking so i will uh, i welcome professor shashidhar again and it's so wonderful for our uh, participants of the biotechnological innovation ignition school to have you with us and i'm sure your life journey your scholarship your ability to nurture talent all of that will inspire them and help them make choices in life which uh, very often are not made in the manner that they should so over to you professor shashidhar unmute yourself unmute yourself unmute yourself yeah thank you thank you professor gupta you know it's a privilege to be introduced by you <laughs> you know i know anil and me are you know for, for a couple of decades now known each other and you know working on variety of different in, in different committees so today um, i'll sort of take you through i'm sure students have come from different disciplinary background here not all of them may have biology background so i'll try to make this um, less heavy on any particular topics in science but the idea is what made me to ask some of those questions what made me to approach in a particular way and what are the lessons i learned in my life and uh, i'm not going into the details of science administration or policy or such kind of things which both anil and me are working on in very different levels today i'm going to only talk about the research the teaching and the science popularization i'm involved in and because that's what uh sort of uh, is really really exciting and fascinating very often what happens is as anil mentioned you know once you have certain awards certain recognitions you will be called to be in very different committees you know government of india sets up so many committees other institutes sets up their own committees you chair some committee or become member of some committees slowly you get on to more and more admin work sometimes they are exciting sometimes they are stereotypic sometimes they are actually boring so i'll not bore of a students uh, participants here with those topics uh, i'll see if i can sort of excite you on some fundamental concepts in biology which i am pursuing and why i am pursuing those questions so let me share my uh, screen okay so um uh, you know i have written a journey in science a journey in life unlike many other professions you can have dual life you can have a a professional life and you can have your own personal life the personal life can also still be split into two one is your personal personal life another is your societal or family life right for example you may have certain hobby you may want to go on trekking you may want to you know read books on your own but some other other um, aspect of your life is you know you have an interaction with your own family and neighborhood it could be a smaller family it could be a larger family depending on how you look at the society at large whereas a journey in science unlike an academic particularly and and also particularly in science you cannot really separate from your personal life because the essence of science the lesson that you learn in science the fundamental concepts of science will start getting you know sort of in start influencing your life so much that you will cannot separate the two the reason i'm telling you is science is not physics chemistry math or biology science is is a set of methods 
scientific methods i'm sure you have heard about scientific temperament you must have heard about it, right a science is a way of understanding the world it could be natural world it could be human world you can understand societal life you can understand politics you can understand history you can uh, study literature using scientific methods you can even you know subject poetry into scientific methods to understand why certain kinds of you know poems or you know or the script or the lyrics would appeal you know generally a large number of people certain kinds of poetry will appeal only to certain you know parts of the world where are certain other types of poetry sort of goes across the time and the space in the world right and geoclimatic conditions to socio economic diversity it appeals to everybody you can actually try to even analyze those using scientific methods so scientific methods based on as you all know unbiased observations validation of your hypothesis and at the same time you also you know uh, follow your interpretation of whatever you observe in a very rational way right this rationality and the the integrity of science where you look at everything in a very unbiased way will also help you in your personal life that you start looking at the world around you the human world around you the world we have created ourselves the societal world in a very unbiased way and you can be actually pretty rational in your personal life too and so that's what one would learn when you pursue science right and and that's what the kind of lessons you know uh, we all get when you pursue science not just as a for a degree purposes and also when you actually start doing scientific research or start teaching science for other undergraduate students now as anil mentioned my personal research interest has been you know trying to understand how from a unicellular embryo all of us are born as a one cell when when our you know mother conceives us at a one cell that one cell it continuously divides and become close to about 50 trillion cells right and and by the time end of 9 months a beautiful baby when it comes out of the mother's womb it will have all the organs and tissues right in one you know appropriate places and are also interconnected so that whole body functions as one unit right it's an enormous complex phenomena that goes on right how you get from a single cell you get such complex individual with trillions of cells right tens of trillions of cells now interestingly as you all know it happens again and again if there are 7 billion people on earth today you have not seen anybody with i anywhere else except on the two sides of the nose you have not seen i'm sure a person with an eye on the forehead or somewhere else you have not seen people with legs or arms in different places exactly in the same position not only the positioning of the organs and tissues you also know that our size irrespective of what the body size is the proportionately all organs and tissues have the same size right that's how you can actually distinguish between a human versus for example orangutan if you have a very very long arms compared to the rest of the body right it will be a completely different species like orangutan whereas all human beings you can clearly say that oh this a perfect human being is simply because the two arms are of the same size and also proportion to the overall body size you can distinguish as as a human being right so how does it happen is a very very you know complex question in biology and that's what i pursue my area of field in biology is called developmental biology and uh, this is what i pursue i'll come to that details a little bit later and i use you know a model organism obviously you don't work on 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 human uh, you know you can do non interventional studies on human i'll come to that later but uh, what i use is a model organism an insect softla melena gaster i'm sure all of you have seen this in the school textbook Uh, if you are not pursuing biology now, uh, Drosophila is considered as the queen of genetics. It is used as a model organism to discover chromosomal basis of heredity, and subsequently, a large number of other landmark discoveries were made using this as a model organism. <clears throat> now, let me start the journey because this is supposed to be more personal story rather than talking about you know all the discoveries that were made all over the world on on any particular topic, right? 
I started off um, as an undergraduate you know, student in an agriculture college in Dharwad. I'm sure all of you may have heard about Dharwad is very famous for Hindustani classical music and very cultural, large number of people were uh, literature uh, scholars, both in prose and poetry and philosophy. And as a young you know, school student, I used to listen to fantastic you know, music and poetry and also literature discussions. In fact, I wanted to pursue you know, uh, Kannada literature as, as my uh, undergraduate program. For whatever the reason, you know, you get peer pressure and, and other things. Many times you don't know why you're doing something at school or college days. Finally, I ended up going to an agriculture college. And there, what we teach, you know, in agriculture is all about, if you look at in 1980s, you know, the uh, Green Revolution happened in 60s and 70s. And the success of Green Revolution is because of application of Mendeleev genetics, right? All of you have studied Mendeleev genetics in the school, if not now. And Mende application of Mendelian genetics for improving the crops, right? And that's precisely uh, what was taught in more detail in agriculture colleges because subsequent to Green Revolution, the curriculum was changed you know, quite a bit. And the more emphasis was given to modern genetics because you can understand the, the intricacies of complex traits, how they are regulated. For example, how to increase the yield, how to increase the nutritional component of, uh, you know, uh, of the crop, how to reduce the incidence of diseases or, or crop pests. Everything needs to be looked at from a, from a genetics point of view. And because if you have to have a more long-term sustainable agriculture, the best way is to understand the genetics of uh, resilience in plants for increased salt concentration in the soil or water or less water in some places or more water in some places and temperature and so forth. So that sort of fascinated me a lot is the study of genetics. And here, the study of genetics was, uh, was not studied in a very, you know, it was actually studied in a different way. I mean, we had a fantastic teachers. They didn't teach genetics as simply inheritance of certain kinds of morphological features that we normally observe. All of you must have seen this picture of Mendel's work you know, it was done in 1850s. You know, you take one particular color and cross to another, you know, flower and a plant of another color uh, and then see how the color patterns are inherited, right? But instead, we were taught not these as simply inheritance of certain externally visible morphological features. Instead, actually, this is the way to study the life itself. Because what you inherit is not just certain features. You inherit all the features of that particular organism. That means the life itself is reproduced, right? For example, from a pea plant to another pea plant, from human to another human, what is inherited is the entire life in itself, right? From, I told you from a single cell, you get a huge multicellular you know, human organism, which is all complexity, but it happens again and again, right? That's one of the reasons why we thought we should study genetics in more detail, not just looking at some external morphologically features, all subsequent internal tissue. For example, how heart is inherited. Heart as an organ, right, is inherited. Because as a, as a single cell, it, there's no heart in that one. But heart develops subsequently in, in the fetus or in the embryo, right? So the genetics was sort of key to understand the life itself. It's not just about certain specific traits uh, that you can see from outside. And then we also were taught, you know, again, another fantastic teacher to teach evolution. Uh, and then he, that person also taught me, uh, you know, how you can compare between organisms, between uh, like say, an insect versus a human or two plants or two insects, whatever you can look at, right? How you can actually understand the commonalities between them and why there are certain small differences. Actually, whether you look at a, a frog versus human or a, or a fly versus human, right? I'll come to that later, the commonality is much more than the differences that we see. However small, tiny an insect could be a few million cells compared to a several trillion cell human body, right? With all the complexity that we have built this around us, right? It's still more similarities than differences between an insect and a human, right? 
compared to let's say living versus non living systems right so in that context again the evolution was taught in a very very different way rather than simply you know giving you some definitions of you know uh, what darwin's theory of evolution was about i'll not again to get into the detail because it's not a lecture on genetics or evolution i just trying to explain how my journey started and why i was so excited about this particular topic and then i am actually was very very lucky because when i was studying you know more and more the molecular genetics molecular biology what you call today uh, started unraveling right although the genetic code was discovered in 60s and uh, you know the whole transcription translational processes were more or less you know reasonably well understood by 70s 80s and 90s the time when we started getting more and more mechanistic details of of chemistry of life right now you start looking at life as how we are inheriting or how the different organs are positioned along the body axis or how we are related to each other you know using evolutionary methods and everything but now we started getting into even more detail and this was even more fascinating finally it's simply a set of chemical reactions happening all the time in a in a very organized state in a cell and many many cells talk to each other and then whole organism is done so you can see that the various level level complexity is simply because they are interconnected but under the lying principle of life is simply certain organized chemical reactions right so dna has a genetic material and it copies itself and to copies itself it requires you know variety of different peripheral systems and that peripheral system is coordinated with the help of information provided in the dna itself and that system comes through proteins which are the workhorses in the cell now we started understanding the life as certain chemical reactions and these chemical reactions become more and more complex in the changing environment because of the evolution and the evolved environment is not constant and we are becoming more and more complex and the second level of complexity comes when they start interacting with each other bacterial cells interact with each other or human and bacterial cells interact with our human human cell interacting with each other in our body in layers of complexity but but however complex it is right underlying you know it's like here for example let's say we are 1.3 billion people on, on on in india right extremely complex because of variety of diversity right and if you try to give one particular picture of what is india who is indian or you know uh, how to you know define india as a country it's almost impossible it's so complex right because of the so much of diversity and where we are interacting with each other so different in some group we interact in a particular way in another group we interact in a different way and 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 it is very difficult to define but what you can define very well is a one individual human being because i'm i'm talking about at that level of simplicity we really no need to go beyond that because we are not talking about biology it's a social science or political science now once you define a human being right then humanity takes over everything human rights take over everything then all other complexities becomes much simpler to address is simply because what is fundamental is every individual is as equal right every individual is as should you know attract same level of respect from each other and in humanity should be the main you know guiding principle in a society that's precisely what gandhi ji also uh, was proposing irrespective of how complex the society is we can still live in a society where in harmony as long as humanity is the primary uh, uh the guiding principle in a society so now we start looking at the life in fact much of this understanding can be uh, what uh, you know social reformers like gandhi ji were talking about can be actually validated using scientific methods in si simply how actually in in you know the whole life has evolved on earth uh, over time because underlying principle this chemical basis of life is exactly the same whether you take a bacteria or human right so there is no difference as well as chemistry of life at this fundamental level from bacteria to human 3.8 billion years of evolution has has given us uh, 
you know, so many different complex types of organisms. Some have become extinct like dinosaurs, some are still surviving like us, but underlying principles has not changed, right? It's exactly the same. It's to an extent that you can now take human insulin gene, put it in bacteria, make insulin protein, and give it to diabetic patients. You can make a, a protein against uh, of the virus, um, you know, let's say coronavirus, put it in bacteria, make this protein, inject it to human, that acts as a vaccine, right? I mean, that's the level of, you know, uh, simplicity and the, uh, you know, commonality we share between organisms. That's what I learned during my... So one of the, you know, lessons I also learned uh, during my undergraduate and postgraduate and, and subsequently during my PhD days is you can actually use model organism in your studies and those model organism work that can be extrapolated to human. If you want to, let's say, work on human diseases, you want to understand the human biology, you want to understand human body, right? You don't need to actually look at the human in, 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 in all ways. You can actually use what is known as model organisms. And then, you know, again, the understanding of evolution it, in its true sense helped us to start looking at, you know, uh, model organism to understand. That I picked up Drosophila because it's, you know, a natural choice for understanding the multicellular development of, of uh, any animal. <laughs> I'll skip this. Another, you know, interesting, you know, that's how you should study history of science. Whenever you want to study any particular discipline, whether you want to look at physics or chemistry, or biology or earth science, whatever you want to study, make sure that you study the history of that particular discipline. It's very, very important because see, by just looking at the latest textbook in your field, you will not be able to get a clear understanding of the subject unless you know how this, this discipline has evolved over time, right? Every discipline has its own, you know, ups and downs. Many, many wrong, you know, hypotheses were proposed. They were turned down and some new hypotheses were proposed. And in you know, the subjects get refined and refined. And what is we see here today, you think maybe everything is perfect. But not necessarily, because if you understand the way science has evolved over time, you know, from new, for example, just look at you know many things that Newton say. Even today, it's there in the textbook. But as soon as in this very next chapter, if you talk about theory of relativity or special theory of relativity or quantum physics, many things that Newton said is not applicable to a certain context. So when we say the whole world is around, you know, follows laws of physics, they are invariant. Right in one tech tech you know, chapter you may read in another chapter you say that already they are subjected to scrutiny and and proven to be wrong. So I think it's very important that you study methods of science by understanding the history of science because history of science is very exciting. If simply I tell you study methods of science, it may become very boring. You know, it's almost like reading a protocol book. Right? Instead, history of science will give you better understanding of both the methods, the kind of methods like protocols. At the same time gives you how science actually evolves and how do you develop your own hypothesis and validate your hypothesis. One of them is this, this is another very, very fascinating uh, movie that was made in 1950s. Today we have mobile cameras, we have small cameras or you know video cameras and all. You can take pictures and very nicely videos. Those days in 1950s, there was no such one. The only camera they had was this film camera, 75 kilogram camera. They mounted the 75 kilogram camera on a microscope and, and imaged, you know, uh, what is it called a neutrophil, which is moving around in our blood. And these small round shaped ones are all uh, uh, red blood cell, and the one which is large, oblong shaped, is the neutrophil. And how and that job of neutrophil is to chase bacteria and and, and clear our blood from any bacterial infection, right? And see this movie. And this is inside our body. It, it exists for itself. It only knows that its job is to go and eat bacteria, right? It's not, you know, controlled by us. You may think about 100 times that how I kill bacteria in my body, you know, not do anything about it. A neutrophil would, job is to sense if there is a bacteria and there is a chemical methods of sensing and it just engulfs it and clears our bottom. It knows how to maneuver itself. This is in the milieu of all these, um, you know, RBCs and so forth. This also gives you an idea that 
we call ourselves as human being but we are just collection of few cells and in organizing an organized state right and every cell has its own role to play and without any of these cells you know we cannot survive the whole body survives is because of these ones and they are also pretty independent to each other there is sort of autonomy in this one right and that's what also gives you a lot of understanding about how the life evolves and and there is hardly you know any difference between what happens in a human body or a mouse body or an insect body and this another way of looking at and you know, how development happens right it also helped me to do my research at the same time to teach biology to undergraduate students now post student i started as my independent career in hyderabad in center for cellular and molecular biology and then later i moved to pune um, after about 12 years so the question i asked in the you know as i told you i am a developing biology uh, there was in when i started my career the one of the most exciting question is the molecular mechanism i told you now we need to understand the molecular mechanism to get a better insights right to get understand the complexity underlying molecular mechanism there are very different layers of complexity at different layers each one you can understand at the molecular level so this is the is the one in the middle is the you know insect which is you know a, a normal insect the two winged flies these flies this drosophila are the same as mosquitoes and the house flies that we see every day the one on the left side has four wings it's a what is called mutant fly one on the right side has no wings has four what is called balancing organs what is shown here in 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 uh, here you can see my you know cursor there is a called balancing organ they are actually work like gyroscopes in an aeroplane right and they are required for balancing of the flight but they don't require it for actual flight for example if you don't have these small you know balancing organs the flight cannot maneuver itself you know so easily Uh, to change the direction or to land and take off quickly now the what actually it, these pictures suggest that a particular mutation can change the this particular balancing organ to a wing or it can change by by change you know a wing into a balancing organ so you have a four balancing organ no no wings and here there are four wings but no balancing organ right so you can as you can see here that must be some relationship between wing and balancing organ so that that's why we can change one particular identity to another identity this gives an enormous genetic handle toolkit what you can call genetic toolkit to look at how very different types of tissues are you know generated in our body you, you remember i told you we start with one cell but we generate all different types of cells we get brain cells neurons or muscles in the you know different types of muscles the muscles of the skeletal muscle under the skin or the muscles of the heart or muscles of the gut or variety of other types of cells in our body right how do you get so many different types right what is the you know mechanism to this is there a sub kind of a sequence and simply you know each one gets a different identity or there are you know sub identities this sort of suggests those sub identities so that means the wing and its balancing organ both have similar identity certain point later during development they get becomes two separate one otherwise you would not have been able to get this using genetic methods in fact this is a landmark work by which led lewis whose name is mentioned here won nobel prize in 1995 in 1995 is where i started my career not because led lewis won nobel prize for this work i started this work in 1992 Uh, when i was a, a independent postdoctor fellow in the national center for biological science in bangalore and later i moved to hyderabad as an independent researcher i continued to work on this okay i'll skip this and i can look at this question at two levels one is what is the molecular mechanism by which a specific gene which is mutant here a particular gene called ubx don't worry about that right you know regulates this kind of a fate determination during development another one is how do you get different organ size say one is very large one other is small what regulates the size one other is it's not about small wing versus large wing is a completely different organ so that is the fate determination another is the size differences right and are the two linked 
and if and how they are basically regulated you know uh, during development why do we get small organs versus large organs right for example if you have five fingers they're all of different size how do we get these kind of you know sequences what specifies the length of the middle finger what left is by the length of the you know ring finger or index finger and so forth right so this is the kind of questions you need to ask you can ask of course hundreds of questions you can ask there's no limit to ask questions the problem in science what we do we ask questions in a way it can be addressed using scientific methods if you cannot find answer using systematic way but you know you can still ask the question but it will remain as a philosophical question rather than a tractable scientific question a scientific question is something which you can address using scientific methods a philosophical question very often is something which is for which we don't have a method to look into it right so that's where the differences come okay now fast tracking because i don't want to spend too much time i want to spend more time for interaction with all of you hopefully i'll try to finish in 15 minutes i kept 45 minutes for this talk middle age crisis right we are all human beings sometimes you keep doing something however successful you are you publish papers you get some awards you get a lot of money even if you are in government service you can still earn a lot of money in these days and i was happy you know i have a small family you know you know nice uh, little you know daughter and um, you know no financial crisis and work was going well patients were very good and they were all doing very well and productive then suddenly you get into what is called a middle age crisis and let's not get into what is middle age crisis why it happens and all those things i did go through it what am i doing uh, what am i doing am i asking a bigger question in science are these you know going on details you know intricate details of what i do you know how much i can pursue like this right these are the kind of questions i started asking myself then i thought let me ask my related to my own work let me ask a slightly more fundamental question in biology right so i told you there is a particular gene which specifies the the two different type of organs in the insect drosophila which is on the left most here which is has two wings and two balancing organs but if you look at other insect groups right let you take your dragonfly what you call helicopter fly some people are called it has four wings identical four and hind wing if you take bees honey bees and bumblebees and all it again has four wings but some of the hind wing is somewhat smaller but it is identical again but if you like beetles all of you have seen beetles right ladybird beetle or other types of beetle the front wing is modified into protective organ there's hard you know the thick skeleton that you see the front wing is actually a modified wing only the hind wing is used as a wing for flight and if you look at lepidopterans all butterflies beautiful butterflies and moths that you see every day right again has four wings but the hind wings have different size and color patterns and eye spots compared to the four wing right now how do you, and all of them are related obviously because they are evolution related they are all what call as holometabolism insect that means they go through what is known as metamorphosis i'm sure you know what is metamorphosis right basically the during early development a young larva will come out a caterpillar or larva whatever you call and it sort of grazes around you know on the food and then it pupates it makes a kind of a cocoon and inside the cocoon you know it uh, metamorphosizes into an adult structure a caterpillar of of a butterfly beautiful butterfly you wouldn't you cannot even compare the you know the you know how can be a butterfly be related to this caterpillar kind of thing but it's part of the same life cycle so i asked the question in 350 million years of evolution from early insect odonata to four major groups of holometabolous insects or right dipterans lepidopterans coleopterans hymenopterans like bees beetles butterflies and moths and flies like mosquito house fly and drosophila right how this has evolved have different just look at the wing alone forget about all other types of body structures just wing alone why some have two wings some have four wings why there are some difference between the four wing and hind wing and what is the role of what is there a common mechanism by which it has evolved 
what are the differences in in the evolutionary path leading to these four again i'll not get into the results very you know exciting work that my phd student did and fantastic work they have done and uh, this is another very exciting area we got into uh, because of a middle age crisis that i mentioned so these are the four insect that we've been studying uh, in our laboratory beetle we use a tribolium tribolium is the small you know beetle that comes to your rice when you keep it for too long and it's a bit uh, stale i'll skip all of these things okay sometime later okay let's say all of these thing i'm studying i can see very clearly i can actually do applied research now there are two kinds of this three kinds of research you can call in sciences particularly in biology one is called basic fundamental science what i was talking about so far is all fundamental science basic science just to ask the question like what is life to you know how we are you know developing in the embryo in the as from embryo to human all of these are fundamental biological questions second is applied research applied research is something it may have some societal application it could be for economic reasons for health reasons you know and such kind of thing including agriculture right? economic so i you know i could see clearly some work of mine what i'm doing has certain applied you know aspect to it so i thought i got into applied one so one of the things i was trying to understand is also the i told you the size difference between the four wing the two wings and the two balancing organs in the drosophila right so when i started looking at it i started seeing that um, you know there are certain genes which are involved in size differences i could manipulate the size uh, using experimental methods generating what are known as transgenic wise you can do genetic engineering change the gene position or change the gene you know function and you can actually change the size and there is a particular rule and how much you can change how which changes whether cell number changes cell size changes or a combination of both how the two are interlinked all of these things we study and one of the genes we studied uh, was a gene uh, which has a homolog in human i told you again i'm also all the time comparing whatever i do with other organism because i you know in the evolution they are all linked the human has 26000 genes we our genome whereas fly genome has 12000 genes but many genes of the fly genome the corresponding genes are there in human i'm sure though all of you know what is a gene is it's a sequence of nucleotides a t g c you can actually look at and they correspond to a certain kind of protein you can look at the amino acid sequence of a protein and look at the human protein versus the sophila protein and see how similar or different they are so one of the protein which is very similar to a sophila protein which i was working on growth control when it is over expressed in human invariably it leads to cancer and particularly if it is over expressed the cancer can cause be caused by multiple other genes let's say there is some gene which has triggered the cancer but this gene is over expressed in that context the prognosis is very poor prognosis is very poor means people who have this particular combination of mutations right would not uh, respond to the chemotherapy as well as the other ones that's what you know that means you treat them but they are not really, you know responding well to the chemotherapy so i started asking the question can i start looking at very different context in which the cancer may become chemo resistant or become more aggressive and not respond to chemotherapy and see and use drosophila as a model system because it's easy to handle compared to very expensive cancer biology that you know whole world is pursuing right and it turned out with that you know this is the human cancer very different hallmarks of human cancer uh, and which is sort of textbook material i'm sure some of you may know about it and flies do exhibit variety of these kind of hallmarks of cancer including metastasis to you know all kinds of other features so we started screening you know for you know where a brand of which conditions you can actually get cancer into somewhere again i'll not get into the detail how we do it these are all the tumors you can grow in flies and it has all the you know necessary hallmarks of a human cancer in these tissues so interestingly when we were doing this we got into a very very interesting concept 
at least I'm sure even if you're not pursuing biology, you know that from DNA, you get an mRNA and from mRNA, you get a protein in the way genetic information flows from the DNA to its functional component that is a protein, right? Now, the, the, the trans basic function of a trans of a basic regulation of a transcription itself is compromised when this particular gene which I'm working in using to solve as a model system is overexpressed and it gives you know uh, tumors. And I also looked at in its human uh, orthologs, I looked at in human cell lines, cancer cell lines, and turned out to be that it's true for both the software and human that we actually hit upon a very fundamental biological mechanism, which is the transcription right, from DNA to mRNA. And that itself is affected when the app is overexpressed under a certain context leading to tumors. And now we can actually think of developing drugs against these ones so that we can you know, control cancer in a particular way. I mean, it's a very long way to go. That's why it's called applied research. Anyway, now I'll come to translation research. There's another way of translation research means you actually take your results to the actual clinical relevance. So we already started translation research. For example, in the context of cancer, we are now looking at human clinical samples, particularly breast cancer, and ask certain questions that like how, you know, what are the different conditions in which the, the breast cancer is becoming chemo resistant and see what kind of a new drug we can propose. We don't have to go through clinical trial. We are not into drug development. We are only giving relevant information to the doctors. If they see these, this gene expressed, treat them differently because they have already have four or five different methods of treatment, but you customize our, you know, to some extent so that, you know, you, the, the outcome of cancer treatment will be a better rather than, you know, going through random and, you know, lean, you know, pick up some, cancer therapy imaging. This another type of cancer research we started, cancer research started is actually using fly itself, right? So I'm sure all of you heard about colon cancer. Colon cancer is caused because of mutation in a particular gene called APC. Don't worry about that one. And there's a normal colon and the bottom is the you know, colon with tumors. And this particular signaling pathway, which I was working in using to solve for wing development and the developmental pathways at all aspect of you know, organ size and shape. This particular, you know, APC is part of this particular pathway. And, and then I started looking at how human APC may be released. So I started generating insect, that is Drosophila, expressing the human gene and started looking at structure function relationship. I got some new insights, how APC may be causing the tumor. And then I developed a, a, a model of system using flies and using eye development of the flies as a model system to do drug screening uh, using flies, right? Again, I'm not getting into the details. So these are all weighted, you know, the, except the normal eye, what is mentioned here, right? All others are treated with drugs, variety of different concentration of the drug. And then you can see, uh, you know, you can actually see how you can kill the cells using the drug. And if you kill the cells using the drug, that means the drug is very effective. And these cells are not normal cells. They are sort of, you know, uh, already in the sensitized way of becoming cancer cells. And that's how you could kill them. If they are normal cell, you cannot kill them. You can grow this normal eye fly uh, any number of uh, uh, days in the presence of the drug, nothing happens to this. So they're clearly suggesting that drug screening can be done very, very specific and effective way using insect as a model system. Again, this translation work got a lot of attention, got me some awards and some recognitions. At the same time, some pharma industry also started using this uh, model uh, for drug screening. Now, I'm, I'm almost ending now in another two minutes. So my main passion, uh, other than research, is education and science popularization. And that's one thing which I spend more and more time you know, whether you go to school or colleges in a rural area or urban area, it doesn't matter where it is, right? And, uh, you know, other than the others, administration funding related policies or science policy related or institutional building, this what sort of excites me much more than anything else is the teachings, you know, biology to undergraduate students, particularly bringing biology 
concepts from historical way they were developed and then trying to sort of connect very different biological phenomena to each other is simply because the underlying mechanism has certain common uh, molecular methods or chemical you know pathways so i'll show you why what excited me most to get into education that's why i moved from hyderabad to pune when I'm, you know iser was getting started and on 1970 uh, just about 2000 97 1997 2000 around that time a landmark discovery was made using flies on eye development and uh, this work by one what you know from a swiss scientist changed my you know focus from research only career to research and teaching career right and and that's what i started doing much more and more after this particular discovery was made so this is the insect and that's a human both have eyes as you can see insect eyes is very different you know at the structural level it's made up of comp it's called compound eye made up of small eyelids and human eyes you know lens and retina based and drosophila eye doesn't have a lens or retina the light directly falls on the on the what is called photoreceptors and then an image is formed in the brain by combining all the you know excited neurons uh, information comes from all the excited neurons right there no sort of an image is formed the way human i pops the image and that the image you know sends the information through the neurons you know the, from neurons how the you know visual cortex builds an image of what we see is similar to what happens in the fly but the, the in flies directly light is taken and that's how image is reconstructed in the brain here a shadow of our what we see is reconstructed in the image right uh, in the visual cortex and people showed that you can and you understand now why eyes are formed how eyes are formed where they are formed where why exactly they are formed by by looking at variety of different ways you can actually reconstruct eyes in different parts of the body on leg or different parts of the body right that much level of understanding they got in late 90s uh, using fly as a model system even more extensively that particular gene which is responsible for the positioning and development of eye in wherever you see in the drosophila turned out to be that similar kind of protein is present in human mouse and they also involved in eye development if a, if a mouse is mutant for this particular protein and there no eye development if human uh, is mutant for that particular protein and there is a blindness in human too right and excitement the climax is here what what gerings lab did in switzerland in basel was they took the human gene or the mouse gene and put it in the fly right so if you look at this experiment where you can make if you express the gene responsible eye in a place where it's not normally supposed to be there you can get eyes in other places right so what they did was similar experiment using but human gene if you look at here in the place where the antenna should be uh, here the place where the antenna should be which is this the smell sensing the organ this is the antenna and this is the compound eye of the scanning electron microscope picture and water gerings lab did express the gene that is responsible for eye development here right make to make the protein here and you can see a normal uh, eye is coming here right in the place of antenna and you can get this whether you use a human eye or a soft light but what you are seeing is a fly eye so the platform there is a body plat platform is a insect platform and you are expressing a gene coming from human or from mouse although their own eyes are so different structurally uh, you know but and physiologically but here what you get is a fly eye this gives how similar certain levels of organ development could be now you can, uh, why there are differences you know you can ask the question there will be about this layer of complex and you know, chemical reaction there may be differences which brings why i of a drosophila is different than human or a mouse eye right this gave me an enormous excitement about you know biology about life about evolution and that's what made me uh, to spend more and more time in science uh, education and uh, and pop science population and of course flies can be used to understand human brain our cognition how we count how we remember why we fight with each other why we have a 
you know, understanding of our own body, uh, uh, this one, how we coordinate our body movements and variety of different things you can, uh, um, yeah, uh, using flies. And I'm using all this for teaching. I'm not researching on all these things, but uh, this is my job to teach. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your time. I hope uh, not taken too long. Uh, hope there's some time for interaction and discussion. These are all students of, of course, I, you know, at least 100 students have gone through my lab, uh, more than 20 PhD students, several postdocs, post PhD students, and large number of undergraduate students and uh, master students who did their projects in my lab. I am extremely, you know, again, most of the things that we take credit, oh, Shashi did this, Shashi did that, but it's really, really the, you know, these are the students who did their work. And all of them contributed, you know, intellectually and manually for, for understanding whatever I told you. And, and they get all the credit for this. Thank you very much. So Mega, we can invite questions and if you have any question, any student has any doubt, any suggestion, any weird ideas, we more welcome. Yes, sir. Hello. So, so Anil, was it okay to have the, this kind of a sleep? Because I didn't want to get into the deeper concept of any one particular topic. Give more view. Yeah, no, no, there. So let's proceed. Yeah, Ayush. Ayush. Um, good afternoon, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, recently I am doing research on one uh, literature survey. We are proceeding for the research on a bacteria that has a special characteristic of producing a polysaccharide, which is used as the world's strongest blue. So the thing is, sir, uh, is it possible that I the means actually the uh, gene responsible for the stimulation and the production of the polysaccharide has already been identified in the previous researches. So I was thinking that is it possible that if I will uh, transfer that gene from uh, that particular bacteria to some other bacteria species and uh, tell make them uh, to produce the same polysaccharide, then is yeah. it possible or not, sir? Okay, good. So uh, this is where, you know, I'll mention something which uh, Anil specifically asked me to mention. So what I told you is how very different concept that we learned can be applied to other concepts, right? For example, certain concept of Mendelian genetics using pea plant, we applied to Drosophila from Drosophila to human, or understanding of Drosophila to human development, disease, drug development, all of those things, including, you know, modern cancer research that I'm doing. And so, at the molecular level, if you want to, you know, uh, there are techniques now, right? We all learn a lot of techniques, make transgenic, you know, bacteria to transgenic insects, transgenic plants, or you can, uh, you know, do what is known as genome sequencing, do bioinformatics and compare, you know, between organisms. But one thing you need to look at is to, if you want to change the organismal function, at the organismal level, that means a bacteria should behave differently. Now, bacteria always lives in small colonies and they interact with each other using chemical senses, right? And then they make a colony and around the colony, they put some kind of a biofilm. Most of your polysaccharides are, you know, a component of this biofilm. And that biofilm helps them to protect themselves from other toxic material of the environment or a drug that we administer if it is a pathogenic bacteria in our body. And, and, and then what happens is that if, if the, there's a heterogeneity in the population, they also behave slightly differently and synchronize themselves so that everybody will, will work together in protecting the whole colony. You need to have that understanding before you introduce a gene. If you're just simply introducing a, a gene responsible for polysaccharide production, in a bacteria and then if it makes a colony, it actually may not make a colony because it may have a completely different physiology than the other bacterial species from which you pick up this gene. You need to understand under what context it produces this polysaccharide and how much of that is secreted under different conditions and what is the heterogeneity in the population you may have to have in case that is also important for them. For example, can you take a single cell and from there you get a multicellular bacteria. And will that colony also produces a polysaccharide in the same way? You have to have that biology understood before you get onto this kind of experiment. 
You can, of course, technically you can do it. There's no problem with it. But then can you successfully do it? Then you need to understand both physiology of the bacteria. Sir, actually, the um, carbohydrate, uh, means polysaccharide, which I told it produces, it produces for its morphology. It helping sticking the bacteria to a particular surface over there. That is being produced on its uh, life process itself. So, uh, means that only I was having doubt that if I will transfer the gene to some other bacteria. That's what I mean. It is, it, see, the two things happen. You know, a gene is what? I mean, it called, codes for a protein. A protein is an enzyme. It does some chemical reaction. For chemical reaction, it needs a substrate. If the right substrate is not there in the other bacterial species that you are talking about, then this enzyme has no function. Even if you put the enzyme, it will not be any function for it because there is no appropriate substrate. Sometimes it requires, you know, two substrate, you know, to form this kind of a polysaccharide, or it may require certain kinds of uh, metabolite as a catalyst, right, for the enzyme to function. That, that's precisely what I'm thinking. It's just not the protein alone which may be missing in other bacteria to make this polysaccharide. There may be multiple other components, whether it, that cell produces the right substrate, whether it's produced as the right catalyst, and all of these things you need to understand, and then you try and do genetic engineering. Okay, DVM, Yadav. Sir, don't you think that every cell does according to its own um, means, sir, like we say that uh, we have a brain, but uh, uh, it is not that, that every cell has its own brain. So it means uh, there is some driving force according to which uh, it acts like uh, uh, passing the genes or something, sir. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. When I say autonomy, autonomy is not always 100%, right? What I said, there is certain level of autonomy. One level of autonomy is all the cells have their own DNA. All the cells have their own mitochondria for the energy production, right? All the food that you eat, all the oxygen you take through the lungs, right? It's not just in one place, you know, all the energy is produced for different muscles to function. Every muscle has to produce its own ATP using its own, uh, you know, uh, ATP generating reaction in the mitochondria for which all the reagents or nutrition that is required or the oxygen that is required comes from, you know, through lungs and other processes, blood and other. But what I'm saying is the autonomy, you need to understand the autonomy first and then see why they are not 100% autonomous, right? For example, why the muscle cells, for certain kinds of muscle cells, which can continuously twitch without brain input, like the muscles of the heart. If I want to lift my hand, right? And I need input from the brain to tell that I should lift my hand. Why these muscles are under the control of the brain, why other some muscles are not controlled, then you can understand the mechanism very well. If you understand this mechanism well, I'll tell you where the application is. For example, I'm sure all of you know about Parkinson's disease, right? You lose control on body and the, and the brain and you can't move your hand properly, you lose that control. So if you understand this complex phenomena and under normal conditions, you should be able to understand what goes wrong in Parkinson and how to treat Parkinson patient. Gaurav or someone, okay, here, Rishabh. Divyamsh, you're okay, right? Good morning. Sir. Yes, sir, like uh, uh, we said sir, about brain, brain itself is a cell, you know, sir? So what we Hello? do is... Brain is not one cell. Brain is made up of hundreds of, uh, sorry, billions of cells. Brain is not one cell. It's a network of cells. It's Again, in brain also, we, there is autonomy. For example, you can have the information coming from the eyes processed separately. Information coming from the ear is processed separately. If there is no information coming from the ear, still the information coming from the eye can be processed and used for certain purposes, right? Or if there's no vision or no... Uh, it's, so brain continues to process information, whatever it comes to it, and then comes out with a behavioral output. And they work independently also. Sometimes they need combination. For example, combination of both what you see and what you hear can actually come out with a, a, a different type of output compared to only what you see or what you hear. Okay, Rishabh. Hello, I'm audible. Yes, you are. I wanted to know that I have heard that uh, uh, prokaryotic or eukaryotic cells have been evolved from the prokaryotic cells. Am I right, sir? Yes. 
Yes, yes. Is it possible to go back with the same thing like from getting a uh, eukaryotic from the sorry getting prokaryotic cell from the eukaryotic cell? No. What happens here is like this: in evolution, there is what is known as uh, you know chance and necessity, right? Sometimes you have a certain genetic mutation in the DNA, and it it happens randomly, but once it has certain specific function in the evolutionary time scale it gets selected for a specific function for a given environment if that uh, the organism survives only if that function is present then that particular mutation becomes necessary for the organism survival later if you try to reverse it it will not survive because in that environment in that condition the organism has developed certain kinds of body structures without it you cannot survive now you prokaryotic eukaryotic happened long ago several several you know more than a billion year ago when because of the endosymbiosis we call fusion of you know prokaryotic cells leading to eukaryotic cell now if you take out mitochondria right now will mitochondria survive on its own no although mitochondria has its own genome but it's only small number of proteins related to mitochondrial function are encoded in the mitochondrial genome it requires the proteins come be encoded in the nuclear genome for its survival and function so mitochondria cannot survive outside world and mitochondria has lost ability to take food from outside world mitochondria can only you know take certain kinds of you know uh, reactants coming from the cytoplasm of the cell to go in inside the mitochondria to produce atp so as you can see here whenever it happened it happened because of this fusion and now it's irreversible because either the rest of the cell will survive without mitochondria nor the mitochondria on its own can survive without the nuclear uh, nucleus of the cell and the cytoplasm okay next so uh, actually um as you said about the central dogma that once the uh, dna comes uh, get converted into mrna mrna get converted into protein okay and the protein is uh, protein is the way that uh, the cell gets its uh, you know informations from the nucleus why is that only protein is uh, secreted to get, uh, to transfer the information why not lipid or carbohydrate okay very good question now what is function from physics point of view i'm sure many of you know that much of physics right even if you are not undergraduate student in physics what is function doing something right function when we talk about it's not that there is an aim at the end but just doing something to do something according to physics what do you need energy right at that energy what it does is basically it gives function is it, it it has to do some reaction or some change has to happen so there is certain activity certain movement it could be movement of atoms or molecules or electrons or something it has to move something whatever it require requires force that force requires you know that energy force and that energy is required according to the laws of physics it's 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 applicable to biology system also now the ability to generate force right whenever there's chemical reaction is much more in 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 uh, in uh, in protein than in lipids or fatty acids or even in dna or, you know to some extent rna that's why rna has a catalytic role in ribosomes when the proteins are made to the peptide bond is catalyzed with the help of an rna molecule not by another protein molecule now this catalytic role that protein is playing or structural role protein is playing is because of enormous chemical properties that can be produced with the help of these amino acids the fatty acids are monologues they have similar kind of molecule there are small one or two variations but most fatty acids the number of building blocks in in the fatty acids are so few some you know uh, certain kinds of carbohydrates sometimes you know double bond saturated sometimes unsaturated you have saturated fatty acids and unsaturated fatty acids and some cholesterol kind of a small lipids but otherwise you don't have that diversity that you can get with the protein that you can get 
Second is the kinetic energy that is to be produced for any function to happen. Proteins are much more efficient. So during evolution, proteins have been selected as the workhorses in the cell, and now it is irreversible. Next. Thank you, sir. So there are a few questions in the chat box. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm not. Can someone read the from the chat box because it'll be difficult yeah. for me to. Mika, Mika, you can have Nikhil in the meanwhile. Yes. Nikhil. Nikhil, are you there? Are you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Bara, yes, bara. Wow. Sir, I have a doubt. So, like, uh, what is the exact definition of life? Sir? Huh. How do you define this? No, no. So again, <laughs> the uh, so. Uh, a biologist definition I can call. I mean, if you want to have a different definition, but I don't think it will have any other definition because now we have understood so much about life. It's an organized state of chemical reactions, right? Now, obviously it's too small, shorter definition and too, um, you know, uh, sort of abstract. The bigger picture, you know, just to give you an analogy, all of you have studied in school textbook how ammonia is produced at the industrial scale, right? Because used in the urea and urea is used for agriculture. So ammonia is always, you know, production is sort of a textbook uh, for an all of us schools. And I, I know it was there in my daughter's textbook and it was there in my textbook when I was doing going to school in eighth or ninth standard. So what is ammonia? It's nitrogen and hydrogen. Now nitrogen, hydrogen is there in the atmosphere all the time. Right, but then why are you not seeing ammonia smell? Why can't you get ammonia smell in the atmosphere? Why? They must be reacting with each other. Indeed, they do react, but they react is such rarely, because you know you know kinetic energy of these atoms are so much, right? Unless they collide, and they collide and have a, a they are in the same space in the in the, for a finite time, you cannot see a nitrogen hydrogen making a chemical bond and becoming. NH2 or NH3, right? So in the absence of such, you know, uh, is it because it's so rare, one or two ammonia molecules are framed, you can't smell that. It is happening all the time in your room. If you are sitting in your room, I'm sure there will be some ammonia molecules. But what we do in industrial scale is we increase the reactant first, put more hydrogen and nitrogen and nothing else in the air. We increase the temperature so that more kinetic energy, more collisions, we reduce, we increase the pressure because that's reactants are very close to each other, right? Because of which there is a definitive that you get get ammonia, right? Again, it's 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 you know again it it is a collision, you know, sort of the kinetic energy of these molecules so much they are continuously moving each other. What is the chance that the two come together and make an ammonia molecule, right? It's still certain, you know, percent probability. That probability are increasing. To an extent that I can say, uh, as a as a manufacturer of ammonia in the factory, I can say, if I set up this vessel, right, a reactant uh, reaction, uh, you know, in the in my furnace in my factory, hundred percent, I'll give you hundred kilogram of ammonia by evening. I can be so definite. In a way, you are already organized the whole thing, right? The whole process of the ammonia, sorry, nitrogen, hydrogen reactions coming, ammonia coming out and kind of stuff. That's precisely what it is. In life is about organized state of chemical reaction. DNA replication, transcription, translation, proteins, you know, acting variety. They're all in, in an orchestrated way they're working. And there's a time and space too. Unless one reaction happens in a particular rate, another reaction will not happen subsequent to this, right? And that space between the two sets of reaction also it will be important to so that they organize. So in the cellular system, the space of the cell and how very different events that happen in the cell and how they are organized, that organized state of chemical reaction is like. That's what. So, so I have a question. Like, yes. from what you have discussed. So 
for basic research for the millennials it takes like 6 to 7 uh, seven years for phd and in the whole tenure they ought to like the determination or the uh, encouragement to pursue it so what was one thing that made, made you like persuaded you to pro- pursue research throughout your life huh. okay so as i told you right in the beginning you know how you look at the well scientific questions right if you look at the scientific question as let's say you know how this particular protein is involved in making polysaccharides in a bacteria right you are looking at in a very very narrow sense and every day you go to the lab you isolate the protein you do some in vitro chemical reactions you put that in another bacteria and see whether same thing happens and you know you may actually become very stereotypical and get bored but you ask the question in a very different you know way you try to ask the question i may be doing in the lab level very small you know nut and bolt experiment but what i'm looking at is a very bigger picture about life it could be prokaryotic life eukaryotic life or whatever it is right you you then you will don't lose the interest because your your bigger question in your mind is always there although you know it's like this right you have a you know let's say a machine let's say right right you know let's say your car right now you drive the car you have all the you know you know how to drive you, know, you move around everything right and just let's say your car you know has a puncture you have to change the tire it's a very boring job and it's a, you know why you want to learn okay i'll just take some to someone and something or even if you learn but it's a boring thing but if you if your journey is a goal and you always keep your journey what you do what you go to do and all those things just spending half an hour in change the tire and you know tightening the nut and bolt you're not going to get bored of it right many times you have to do it a day and night right so that's why you know you need to have a bigger picture in your you know mind when you pursue science then only the day to day minor details that you work on will not be deter or will not be a boring you know job okay so thank you sir according to your definition of life sir is uh, sir we can say that uh, there is like previously we said that cell has uh, some kind of autonomy but according to the definition of life sir it is not that uh, there is nothing like autonomy yeah i mean autonomy is you know it's it's a relative right of course you know it's true for example i if i ask a question are you autonomous you can say yes i take my own decision i'm i'm totally autonomous but you know you know in another context you say how can you be autonomous unless you are you know dependent on someone else for your food right and so there are variety of different levels of you know question of autonomy like i'm only looking at I'm, in a relative sense i'm talking about in a multicellular organism from a developmental perspective development biology perspective i was referring to autonomy in a particular way Arav, it's not a 100% uh, you know autonomy in all context like sir, we do everything but everything is just like a reaction of the previous things so if Devansh, we see Devansh, Devansh, yes, Devansh, yes, let some other people ask questions okay sir okay. yeah gaurav hello thank you sir sir my question is a little bit different like so speak are... loudly gaurav i can't hear you yes, sir am i audible yes yes so as uh, like my question is a little bit different as you have done research works like in terms of exploration uh, from the genetic level to the phenotypes so uh, like if we observe a small speck of this earth uh, like we observe intelligence in that so how do you see the consciousness in that like we talk about on the consciousness also good good that's my you know one of my you know favorite lectures is how to understand uh, consciousness right what is consciousness so perhaps it takes a lot of time now uh, but there is sufficient understanding of it so how if we start with let's say what is the how the information comes to your brain from outside world you see something hear something smell something how that information get processed right and then we come up with the behavioral output it could be let's say if you eat some if you see some nice food you want to eat or if you see a tiger you want to run away from that you know that's a behavioral output. at the same time you also have what is known as memory of your past experience that sort of modulates your behavior that's what learning is all about 
What is learning? Your past experience based with the help of memory, what is stored in your brain, memory cells, will help you to modulate behavior. If you eat, let's say, a mango from a tree and if it, that mango is very, very bitter or very sour, however, you know, nice yellow looking mango, you know, pulpy one, you wouldn't eat the same thing next time because you know it's a very sour mango. You don't want to eat that from that particular tree. You may go elsewhere and try another mango from another tree. So in, once we understand all of these things, the next big question is what is consciousness? Why are we aware of consciousness is being aware of what you do. So first you need to know how you are aware of something, right? And then you ask the question why we are aware of that then you will be able to address this question of bigger question of consciousness, right? There are many things we do, we are not aware that we are doing. Many things we do, we get uh, become aware only after having done it, right? Not necessarily that, you know, while you are doing it. And many times we say we have taken a decision to do something. And very often the decision would have already happened in the brain some cells and you become aware of it much later. Although you want to, like for example, I want to lift this mug, I would, you know, message goes from the brain, but the, the message would have already gone to the hand to lift the mug even before you consciously aware of it, right? So now consciousness is just current understanding of neurosciences. Consciousness is, is some kind of a, you know, aberration. It's some kind of a, you know, uh, you know a, an inadvertent output of the brain when it's doing multiple things that it so happened that one part of the you know brain you know is trying to process the information that's already we are doing it right and that's what consciousness is what it's there in many many other animals too which can experimentally and behaviorally show that and we are much more aware of what we do is simply because of another angle uh, another reason is because of our language ability the syntactic language that has given us uh, that that we have the, the from the you know we have a syntactic language of the brain and the same thing is communicated through using some language that we learn in our uh, childhood time, whether English or Hindi or Kannada. And that language ability also has complicated this whole process of consciousness. So much of our misunderstanding of consciousness is because of the, the cultural reasons in which the language has played a big role because we communicate with each other much more than two animals communicate with each other. But at the fundamental level, the consciousness of a human or a chimpanzee or, or a mouse is not very different. We can discuss in another talk. You can invite me to give a talk in your college. I'll be happy to spend an hour or two on this. Thank you, sir. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Yeah, sir, since you told you have done uh, research on the uh, cancerous cell as well, sir. Uh, sir, the P53 cell is known as the cell which used to control the apoptosis and all the process in the cell. On the uh, study, it was found that elephant uh, has a less chance of suffering from cancer because it has 20 copy of P53 cell. Sir, has the research been going on on that direction, like to increase the number of P53 cell on human beings for preventing cancer and all? Is there any... Fantastic. Fantastic. Yes. So, you know, we, we, the human problem is you cannot increase the, you know, you can't do genetic engineering, increase or decrease the number of genes. So what you do is you use a chemical method, you use a drug, right? So P53, if it is not functional, right, the cells will not undergo apoptosis, they will survive and, you know, continuously divide and become cancerous. So what you do is there are two ways of looking at it. One is you know, it's like this, right? Let's say you have a, a event which happens in one, uh, you know, and then subsequently the another event happens, which is dependent on the previous event. So P53 is required to turn on the pro-apoptotic genes. Pro-apoptotic genes in turn turn on other things, right? So what you do is you use a drug to activate the apoptosis, even if P53 is missing, right? So for example, today, in you know, 2015, a new anti-cancer drug was re you know, released in the market called carboplatinum. Carboplatinum is most effective way of inducing apoptosis in cancer cells, even if P53 is uh, not functional, right? So that uh, has actually, you know, in fact, the curing cancer nowadays is, is much more 
I'm sure you know you are too young to understand this. When I was young, as a college student, in whenever in my family, if someone who turned out to be cancerous, it was like a you know in the in the old Hindi films you see, right? The whole if the, almost the whole world has collapsed on the head and the family would be completely devastated because someone has a cancer and kind of stuff. But these days, we just shrug our shoulders. Oh yeah, cancer will go to a treat, you know, treatment and you know, we'll be all right. Unless, of course, you have other problems and you're very old and too many, too late you detect that you have a cancer. If you're detected early, it can be treated really well. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I had a question regarding the human eye and the drosophila eye experiments. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, the eye that the additional light that was generated on the drosophila was that eye a uh, functional eye or it was just a vestigial organ type? It was not that functional. Uh, I didn't understand. Say it again, repeat, please. Uh, sir, the additional eye that was uh, gen developed uh, on the drosophila hmm. was that eye functional or just oh, wow. uh, okay. like a drosophila? I'm, sure, I'm sure all, all students ask. So again, you have to ask the question. Again, in the talk about autonomy of a cell, what is the function of an eye, right? It's a different than the function of the brain which processes the information coming from the eye. Function of the eye is when it senses the photon of the light, the protein gets activated in the in the eye cell and that information you know is passed on to the brain and then brain reconstructs the image because it's it's receiving these photons from so many different eyelets right you know the neurons as far as eye is concerned its function is just to get excited when there is a photon excited means you know there's an electron shift when the photons fall onto the eye protein and then send the information to the other part of the cell right that much level, it's functional. But because there is no corresponding neuron taking the information to the brain, which is another tissue, another cell, so there is no visual perception from this side. So that way, it's not functional, right? So you know, one to you know, it, you can say as a eye is partially functional. As a as a eye cell, definitely it is functional. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, good. Yeah, Aditi has another... asked a question that did you ever face a moment when you thought, let me leave it all? <laughs> and how did you sustain your energy? That's a question Aditi has asked. Wow. Well, that's what the, my mid career crisis was. It was, you know, I was sort of getting bored of doing the same thing or similar thing, however exciting they were. I, I told you, I never had any problem with my publications or getting money for research or even some awards and recognitions. But, you know, wanted to give up and never had that, uh, you know, maybe I was fortunate. I was in a good place, good, good students, good colleagues around. So I never had to have that problem. Uh, some people have to have, for example, you know, you may get to a crisis where you don't have money. So one way, when I did have one one time, there was absolutely no money to do research. I was wondering what do I do with my students. So I told my students, let's do one thing. Why don't you put up put all of our thoughts and look at what is there in the literature and look at the bigger picture of what we're doing, right? And why don't we write a review of what we do? There are two types of publication. It's called research publication of what we have originally generated results. Another is review of this literature. Of, of the time, and then you can actually ask some more interesting question once you have a review done. So, in fact, we asked some very interesting questions in this review, which has actually led to new project, got new funding for this. So, one way to come out of it is actually sometimes it helps take a pause and look back and see all that is done, not only by you but all others in the field, and then come out with new interesting questions rather than continuously. You know, go in a very blinded way. Okay, anything else? Mega. Thanks, Anil. I'm very, very impressed with the kind of questions these kids are asking. Well, these are the students. All I was worried country. that you know my talk is so general and there is no particular 
you know, topic I discussed at length, but you know, they are fantastic. Yeah. So, so, we can take this last question, sir, with your permission. Yeah, I have another meeting at one o'clock. Someone is waiting. Okay. In fact, uh, Anil's uh, some uh, senior colleague from I am Ahmedabad. I have a meeting with him at one o'clock. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Last question. Yeah, Divyansh. Sir, just wanted to ask about, uh, you said about unbiased observation. Like, uh, sir, humans are always, it means they are ought to be biased. So how to do an unbiased observation? Fantastic. I think this is uh, something which is required for in all of our life, not just for doing science in the laboratory, right? We have to be unbiased. You learn with practice how to be unbiased. The first thing you need to ask for yourself to train yourself to be unbiased is, am I correct? Am I honestly correct? Right? So, see, what scientific methods you do, what is known as you first frame an hypothesis. And then you say, I want to validate this hypothesis. When you say, right, if you are, you know, you think that you have done already, you know, you, this is your opinion, you are, we believe in this, it cannot be any other thing, then there's no need to validate. And also scientific methods, you actually want to prove that you are wrong. There is what is known as null hypothesis, right? You want to prove that your null hypothesis is correct. Our null hypothesis is opposite of your scientific hypothesis. So in that way, first of all, you have to be extremely honest to say that maybe I'm wrong. In fact, I'm wrong. That's what I want to prove rather than I'm, I'm right. I want to prove. I said I want to Right. So in usually we don't word the, use the word, I would provide the proof. You say, I would like to validate my hypothesis. I won't say I would prove my hypothesis. You say you proved my hypothesis, you already are biased because you want to prove something. That's what happens with lawyers and politicians and you know everybody. I want to prove that this person is the murderer. We are not proving anything here. We are trying to validate, you know, it can go either way. It can be true or false. In fact, I start with opposite end because that will be, make me much more unbiased because I will say that I'm wrong. I want to prove that I want to wrong. The experiments are all designed in such a way that I want to prove that I'm wrong. That's what your null hypothesis is all about. With little bit of training, you can get it, but you need to be extremely dedicated and honest to scientific methods. You should not get into a where quick returns and all those things, then doomed. Thank you, sir. Mega, you can thank now formally and we then will wrap it up. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, you. your wonderful session. And uh, I deem it would be really inspiring uh, for all the students and the way they are interacting with you and really amazing. I, I can admit that these bands is very curious, sir. <laughs> yeah, they are asking. I'm quite happy the way they react, you know, interacted yes. and asked the nice questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope it was useful. and uh, it is. It was amazingly useful. I have shared the link of your lectures at Ashoka University also with them. Okay. So okay. that the consciousness lecture, they can, the, the second lecture of yours there okay. Uh, okay. does address the issue of consciousness. So I thought they can see that uh, later on. And okay. please uh, do keep posting us with your lecture link so that we can pass so on with the alumni I, of this. This is the eighth base. So seven gaps, have, seven batches have already passed and they would also like to have access to it. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, thanks. Thanks. So much. Thank you. You've been touch. Yeah. Yeah. Bye.